Huh? We had a lot of them. All right. Well, very good. Well, it's good to see everybody. It's, like, it's always wild. You do the opening thing, and then there's a lot more people when I get back up here. So it's always, it's always good to see everyone. Um, so for those of you that are visiting or new or haven't been here in a while, we've been working our way through Romans, and we are in Romans 11 tonight. And this is, um, in some ways, a very timely... All, all, the, all the passages of Romans through this section, they get kind of tricky. I mean, there's a lot of controversy... There's a lot of, uh, these are the passages people tend to argue over, and they're the passages that if I didn't believe in expository preaching, which means sort of preaching every verse as it comes along, I would most likely skip these, because it's like, they're sort of just like, okay, we have to talk about all kinds of weird stuff here. So this is sort of the weird stuff section of the Bible. Um, and if you're troubled by that, the Bible is full of weird stuff, right? I mean, if you read the Bible and you think it's none of it's weird, you're not getting it, okay? <laughs> because there's just lots of weird stuff in the Bible. And it's usually good and instructive and helpful. This passage, though, is on the remnant. And it's this whole idea that Paul is beginning to talk. This is also a very theological and sort of a Jewish versus Gentile passage in Scripture. So, uh, you know, you can get your Bibles and follow along, or you can just read on the screen. But one of the things that has come out of this line of thinking in Romans is that a lot of people believed that God's favor and the, Jew, and the people who are his chosen people now are no longer the, Gentile, the Jews, but it's now become the Gentiles, right? Have you ever heard that thing, that God's sort of done with the Jews and now it's the Gentiles or the people? Well, Nazi Germany really embraced that argument, right? That the chosen people were no longer the Jewish people. God, they, that was Old Testament, New Testament. Now he has his new favorites, and that's all of us Gentiles. And the reason I wanted to sort of talk about, I wanted to sort of, this is not really in the text, but it's something I wanted to say um, because I feel like it's important this sort of drawing lines and saying we're the right ones and they're the wrong ones. It's, man, there's been a lot of that in the news lately, right? I try not to be very political here because there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of the heaven and there's the kingdom of man. And our goal is for the kingdom of our Lord to become the kingdom of this earth. And there's a lot of opinions about the kingdom of man, and I don't want the church to ever get drawn into kingdom of man stuff because it keeps people from hearing kingdom of God stuff, right? Amen. But sometimes, and I thought this week, I felt like people from the kingdom of man were beginning to color what the kingdom of God was. And I think there's been a lot of, I'm not going to get into the politics of it because there's probably been a lot of, Everybody lies about each other, you know? There's all this misinformation on the kingdom of man stuff. But when they started to say, there were a lot of verses out there, a lot of people out there beginning to say that the church is really about white supremacy. And that's where you've got to say no, <laughs> right? In the kingdom of heaven, there is neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. There's neither Jew nor Greek. Right? We are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. There's not great or small, high or low. Amen. God does not see color. He does not see ethnicity. I mean, he created it all, right? Amen. And Amen. the kingdom of heaven is that we are all equal. I mean, if you, but for, so we cannot let it stand that the church in any way embraces one set of people are favored more than God to God than another set of people, right? That is not what the kingdom is about. It's also not about it's okay to diss and to put down and to not love people. I'm going to jump to the end of this passage for just a second. Paul, in a very arcane argument in Romans 11, is essentially saying even the bad things that are happening to the Jewish people right now, he's doing it so that they can be drawn back in. But the heart of God is for everyone to be reconnected to him and to be loved by him and to be able to receive his love. And he is not 
so there's all these passages in the scripture which says the first will be last and the last will be first, right? And that the kingdom belongs to the least of these when you've done it to the least of these. And so I just want us, as, when we, as we embrace our politics, to do it in light of the kingdom of heaven and to know that God loves all of us, right? And that he is not willing that any of us should perish, but that all men should come to know his son. And Jesus loves the little children, right? Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. I just feel like it's an important thing for us to say out loud. And I don't know that that's necessarily political. And I'm not saying that one side has said it wrong or the other. I'm just saying when they start to paint the church and saying that this is what the church believes, that we have to say whether or not that's even what the person who said it intended, right? We have to say that is not what the church is about. See, I don't think that's politics at all. Good. I mean, yeah. that's not a political statement. That's a statement of, of what we as Christians claim to be our principles. Amen. You know, and to have people, I mean, it, it really bothers me when mm -hmm. politicians claim, you know, wherever. Yeah. to be and make it a really big point to talk about how big their faith is to them. And then they act in ways that are directly contrary to that. And, you know. That's, that's exactly, yeah. And that's kind of what I wanted to say. There's been people, there are segments of the church that are feeding into that. And I feel like that we have to say as a church, that's not, that's not the kingdom that I belong to. That's not the kingdom that Jesus came to save, to, to die for. No, we don't live or die by who's in charge of this country. Amen. Or Amen. who's in charge of this state or this whatever. You know, we live or die by the grace of Jesus Christ. And that's... Amen. That trumps any politics. You know, no pun intended. That trumps any politics. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> now you turned the corner. Really okay, no okay, okay, all right. All right. Worked out. Okay. You're setting up Romans 13. Yeah. <laughs> interestingly timed mm -hmm. in that all that focus of division and everything and then it's a reminder of who's really in charge mm -hmm. when the hurricane came through and you got to see people really stepping up and and acting in the way that they should act and coming together versus all this division yeah yeah and that's right and i don't yeah, that's the weird thing, because in the Bible, there's a lot of times it does say, and God sent the hurricane, you know, and it's like, but I am not one of those guys that knows enough to ever say that, but it is true. Is. Huh? Is. Well, my thing is only him, you that's know, exactly <laughs> yeah. so let him sort it out. So what our, we are called to do is to be faithful, right? And that's, that's sort of the, the gist of this. Uh, so we're going to, let's jump into the scripture. So this is verse 11, and this, so what... For those of you that haven't been here for a bit, anybody remember what verse 10, what chapter 10 was talking about? What was the big theme of chapter 10? Preaching the good news, right? Right. And how are they going to hear unless somebody is sent to tell them, right? So that's an important segue to keep that that was just a few verses before this that Paul was saying. Blessed are the feet of those who bring good news, right? Because how, unless you're called, you're not going to know you're called unless somebody tells you, and how are you going to tell you unless somebody preaches to you, and how's somebody going to preach you unless they're sent, right? So the reason I'm saying that is that now he's going to start talking about this weird world word, which is election, right? And so election is one of those words that sort of sound, well, and this passage has got some weird things, which sort of says God chooses who gets in and who gets out. And you can spin that a lot of different ways, right? Well, uh, isn't that the same as that predestined stuff? That's... Why don't you explain it to us? <laughs> in a few words. <laughs> well, I'm going to try to in this passage, actually. So let, let me get to it. So let's read the scripture. All right. Um, I asked then, did God reject his people? And who are the his people he's talking about? Israel. Israel, right. All right. Okay, very good. By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people. 
Uh, I've got too small a print here. Okay, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. That's a scary word for some people. <sighs> okay, don't you know that the scripture says in, this pa in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and have torn down the altars and I am the only one left and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. That's a huge verse. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so what he's talking about here is a, a very interesting thing. What did, do you, anybody remember what Paul said about his people two chapters ago in verse 9? He offered up a trade that he would be willing to make for his people. What was that? He would go to hell if his people would go to heaven, right? So this is a personal, a personal journey for him. He loves his people. Whenever Paul went into a city, we just finished the book of Acts a year ago, so some of you should remember. When he went into a new city, where did he go first? He always went to the Jewish synagogue first, right? And when they kicked him out, then he'd go to the Gentiles, right? But he always went to his people first. So as he, and he was called the apostle to the Gentiles, but did that mean that he had turned his back on the Jewish people? Huh? He's Jewish. He's Jewish. That's his point. It's like saying, has God rejected the Jews? He's like, no, I'm a Jew, <laughs> right? I am, I am a Jew, and I love my people, and I'm hoping that they will accept it too. And there is almost, so a couple of things about the word remnant. What, is, what does the word remnant mean? Huh? Leftover. Left over? The last part, the last part yeah. I picked up this, I didn't mean to make a political statement by using the flag, but it's kind of like you can tell that there's a lot of that flag that's gone, right? But there's still a remnant remaining. I feel like in America, we as Christians are becoming more and more a remnant. You know what I mean? That at one point we were sort of a dominant force in the culture, but now it seems like we are a more marginalized force in the culture. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my savior is, is big for like athletes and a lot of other people. It's just that like buzz on it. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have that, for no pun intended, the fear of the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> kind of with, always, you know, it just depends. I mean, politicians throw it around, just a lot of people throw it around. <laughs> well, so the encouragement here that, yes, you're right, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, there's a lot of cultural Christianity, but it seems like the impact that we have had on the culture has really changed, right? We used to look, the values and the morality that was being expressed in our culture seemed to be more reflective of the Christian faith than it is now. The marriage, you know, the whole kind of, you know, people staying married and raising a family and all of that stuff, would, the family was a lot more holistic 50 years ago than it is now. And that doesn't mean it was perfect. It just means it reflected more of a biblical worldview than it does now. You know, I mean, marriage, most people, the majority of people I think under 30 now are just living together. They're not really getting married. So the old concept of marriage is changing so that there is a remnant of folks who still believe this way, but there are a lot of people who believe differently, right? So we're moving into where we are a bit of a remnant. And what Paul was sort of saying, so Paul